You're listening to DraftKings Network. Get ready for the greatest roast of all time. The Roast of Tom Brady. A Netflix live event happening May 5th. Hosted by Kevin Hart, the seven-time world champion gets his cleats held to the fire by famous friends and frenemies on an unforgettable night where everything is fair game. Tune in on May 5th at 5 p.m. Pacific time for The Roast of Tom Brady, live only on Netflix. You ready? Showtime. On May 3rd, summer starts with The Fall Guy. What are you doing later? Let's drink a spicy margarita. Make some bad decisions. Yes! Audiences are falling in love with the most entertaining film of the year. Fall guy. Fall guy. Fall guy. That's what the poster said. See Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt in the movie critics say exists to make you happy. Trying to make it out? Nope. Because I don't either. It's not what I'm into right now. What are you into? Talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fall Guy. Only in theaters May 3rd. Read it PG-13. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hockey Show. My name is Roy Bellamy. That's David Drucker, the Hockey News. We have Dennis Bernstein from the fourth period and Sirius XM NHL Radio coming up in the next segment to talk about the NHL playoffs. But first, we talk about the Florida Panthers. They are leading 3-0 against the Tampa Bay Lightning in the wow. first round. Uh, yeah, I had them in five. I did not expect this to happen. Um, them potentially sweeping. I thought that so that uh, Andre Vasilevsky was still one, but doesn't seem like that's going to happen. No, he still might, but, man, I, I thought this series was going at least six, maybe seven. These teams hate each other. They're pretty evenly matched, as we've seen in the first three games. I think it just kind of comes down to the Panthers are deeper. Panthers are more skilled. Uh, the goaltending has been equal. The special teams has been – it was equal heading into game three. Now it's a little bit more Panthers leaning, mm-hmm. which is big. And, and yeah, the Panthers, they, they might sweep Tampa Bay, which would be very poetic, I think, for a lot of people in South Florida. The other big thing is – Tampa has been trying to go the Panthers into these post whistle scrums. The Panthers are not having any of that. The only time you've ever seen them actually start something is when Sergei Bobrovsky has been accosted. Yes. That's it. And I love that, by the way. I love that that's not – there's no, no letting that happen. Every time he gets poked, every time someone charges the net a little bit too late, they're all over it. I feel like that's something that – not necessarily with this specific Panthers team, but Panthers teams in years past, I have not liked that they don't get the goal. And, you know, obviously I'm a little biased as mm-hmm. a goaltender. But I love that they're doing that, and I love that they're not getting goaded into anything else. Yeah. And they're just very business as usual, like, we're here for a job, we're going to do it. I think that's really what, you could, what you're going to ask for from your Panthers team in the playoffs right now. All right, so as far as discipline, the Panthers have been excelling in that. I mean, game three put aside there, but yeah, they've been staying out of the penalty box. Uh, and Tampa really hasn't come through all that much in the power play, so that's good. Let's start with game one. The Panthers won 3-2. Uh, and, and Alexander Barkov was excellent in that game. He provided two assists, including a highlight assist of Carter Verhage for his goal. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that ended up being a good game. Uh, they were stout defensively, and they ended up winning. That play to Carter Verhage was so nice because Verhage started it at the blue line. He got it to Barkov on the boards. Barkov watched Verhage as he just shot down the other side of the ice and waited for him. The lane opened up. It was gorgeous. It Barkov was, is definitely on point right now. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just a nice play there. And, like, that's that's what happened. I mean, that that's a play they obviously practice. Yeah, well, you can tell. These are guys that have been playing on the same line together for a while. Like, they know each other. They know where they're going to go. That's something that they've been working on. Yeah, it's beautiful to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was beautiful to see the entire game. Uh, Matthew Kachuk's empty net goal was the game winner because, again, I I mean, Paul Murray said that he was fine with that cross check. You weren't. But I wasn't. You were not. You that were was pissed. just a wasted penalty that shouldn't have been called. Well, it, it went against the grain of how they had been calling that entire game one. Like, okay, they t- they called it a little tighter in the first period, fine. They opened it up in the second. They let everything go in the third. And then all of a sudden you're going to call that when it's already a two-goal game, it's over. And it wasn't even like a hard, like one of those obvious penalties that you have to call. So I'm with you on that. It almost seemed like they were playing up to uh, <laughs> the casinos in that one, right? I, was, was know, I'm not going to comment on that. But I, I will say that, I, you know, it wasn't kind of nice and... Very uh, expected for Paul Maurice. He, you know, to be so diplomatic about it. He's gotten so good at that. Yeah. Well, he just doesn't want to get fined. I wouldn't either. I mean, <laughs> they, they probably had like a Paul Maurice role after what happened <laughs> the season before. No, there's definitely like a swear jar with Paul Maurice's face on it somewhere. Yeah, that's going towards the team dinner. Uh, game <laughs> two, the Panthers won in overtime, three-two, uh, and that one was 
That one's pretty exciting. Uh, I can tell you right this ba- uh, like this based on all three games. The Panthers have basically won the first five minutes and subsequently won the entire period in all three of these games. Yeah, well, the starts have been big. The starts have been really big for the Panthers, and that's kind of what was a key to Game Three, I think, because they got off to a really good start. They were able to once again get the lead. They've gotten the they've gotten the lead every game this series, but yet yeah, Game Two, Game Two is interesting because Tampa really put their foot down in terms of in the defensive zone, literally putting their foot down, keeping the exit strong, getting their entries, getting their flow, and that was why they were able to generate a bit more offensive opportunities than they did in Game 1. But ultimately, once again, you saw the goaltenders stepping up and the Panthers coming through again in overtime. The first period, we saw uh, Sam Bennett get hit in, uh, with a slap shot in the hand by, uh, I believe it was Brandon Montour's slap shot there. Yep. And he did not return. He ended up missing game three. In the second period, the Tampa Bay Lightning ended up making adjustments, and they ended up scoring. And possibly the best save I've seen out of all Panthers' time, one of the best saves I've ever seen a goaltender make was Sergei Bobrovsky's save on Matt Dumba on his yeah. backhand. Like I'm quickly scanning my memory banks for Panthers' saves over the years. Like I'm... Luongo, Statue of Liberty glove saves are flashing through. Van Beesbrook, I think, on Valerie Kamensky in Game 4 overtime in the final. Um, no, it was on Ozil Lynch. Stand Ozil Lynch. Oh, yeah. I can hear Gary Thorne in my head. Yeah. Ozil Lynch for the cup save. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was probably the probably the best save in Panthers history, I think. Uh, unreal. We mm. made the rounds on social media. Paul Maurice was talking. Everybody was talking about it after the game. Uh Game saving too, because Tampa would have taken a lead there. Yeah, and in the third period, it's back and forth, and then they went into overtime and Conor Verhage, Mr. Clutch. Yeah, his fifth overtime goal of his playoff career. In that fourteen overtime games, though. Yeah, like that's insane. Yeah, forty-seven total playoff games. Yeah, he's tied for third most now with uh, Glenn Anderson. That, that's an '80s name that you got to pick off the floor right there. That's Pat- a playoff guy right there. Yep, Patrick Kane and Corey Perry. So only two are in front of him. Joe Sakic. And Maurice Richard. So he's clutch. Unbelievable. Mr. Overtime. And speaking of overtime, 11 straight overtime playoff wins for the Panthers, dating back, uh, I think, three playoffs now to Ryan Lombard scoring in Tampa, the overtime winner uh, in, I think that was 2022 series, but whatever it was. Yeah, that was the one that went six. They haven't lost a playoff game since Trocek was tripped in 2016. That was the last playoff game, that, or overtime playoff game that they lost. They've won 11 in a row since, three off the record set by Montreal in the mid-90s. I, that's mm-hmm. that's insane. It is insane, and that game should not have gone to overtime, by the way, because, again, Vincent Trocek was tripped. But, yo, know, that's neither here or there. That's in past history that I will never forget. I will always bring it up whenever that happens. Uh, game three... <laughs> That happened the night before. The Panthers won 5-3 to three in Tampa, which puts us in this situation where they can end up sweeping on Saturday. Now, they have a, they had a re, uh, reconfigured lineup because of Bennett not being in there. Uh, Stephen Lawrence took over Kevin Stinland's spot on the fourth line. Kevin Stinland went out to the third line, and Anton Bennett took over Sam Bennett's spot. Proved dividends in the first period. I think Anton Lindell has been really the story the, the, the quiet story of, for the Panthers so far in the playoffs. Even before Sam Bennett went out, Lundell was playing great on that third line. He was looking good on the second power play. And with Bennett out, I, you talked about not just Lundell moving up to the second line and not skipping a beat between Verhage and Kachuk, but Kevin Stenland moving up to the third line and that line maintaining its ability to maintain puck, uh, zone possession and zone time. And the fourth line, Steven Lorenz stepping into the middle he barely played. I think he played four games from late December to late March. Mm-hmm. And now he comes in Looks like he's been playing all season, fits in perfectly with what they've been doing. And, yeah, that, that fourth line last night, Kyle Ocposo, his first playoff game since that 2016 year, uh, you know, they were on the Islanders team that beat the Panthers. But yeah. just unreal. And this is what we've talked about. We've talked about it a lot, Roy, is the depth on this team and how big of a strength it is for the Panthers. And now it's showing. You lose Sam Bennett. I would have told you, heading into the playoffs, there are two guys on the team who I think are crucial that you cannot lose, and that's Barkov and that's Bennett, mm-hmm. because they're – they center two big lines. You take them out, it really messes with the depth of the forwards, and it's also special teams. But as we saw yesterday in Tampa, when you could expect Tampa's best shot, they did not want to go down 0-3, which they did. Florida took Tampa's best shot. They got up off the mat, and then they took them out. Yeah. Very impressive. You take Ben and I out of the lineup, you lose a lot of your forechecking, especially on that second line, which is a lot of grit. And uh, it seemed like uh, the Panthers really got through it, especially uh, especially with that wave that the uh, Lightning ended up Pushing in the second period, yeah, yeah, that that was a 
good job by them. Uh, that first goal for uh, Matthew Kachuk, they failed to clear, and there were a couple of, couple of times where the Lightning failed to clear, and they paid dearly for it, and it led to a very good play, short little forward check, nice behind the net play from Anton Lundell, and he found Matthew Kachuk. It was cool. When I, I was watching back the goals last night, and what I noticed uh, on that goal and on Reinhardt's goal was the primary assist. Kachuk was from Lundell. Reinhardt was from Tarasenko. Both of those passes, they were looking the other way. Mm. Both of the guys that passed it were looking this way. They passed it that way. I think that's so, just the little things that nobody talks about. But that's what opens up the passing lanes. That's what helps get these things going. A little misdirection. Oh, it's just gorgeous. And to see that, see it happening on different levels, on different lines, with guys who are, have not played together a whole lot, whether it's Tarasenko on that line or whether it's Lundell on the second line, uh, I don't know. I just feel like I'm running out of superlatives right now for the Panthers. I want to get back to the start of that second period. Uh, in fact, the start of the game, actually, because the Panthers did get into a bit of penalty trouble. Uh, the Gustav Forsling penalty was not a penalty. I don't care what anybody says. That was not interference. Not at all. But the start of the second period, that was all lightning. It felt like the entire crowd. It felt like all 18 of the guys on the bench. Yeah. And it felt like the, uh, the refs and the linesmen were all against the Panthers, all screening Sergey Bobrovsky in front of the goal. All of them. Everybody. All 19,000 people were on the that's ice. That's what it takes, right? Yeah, that's what it takes. But I thought that was really the beginning of what I was expecting to be Tampa's comeback in the series. They're going to make it a series. They're going to make life out of it. They sweat two goals in like two minutes, 12 seconds or whatever it was to, to take their first lead of the series. We've been there before. We've been in that building before. Like That felt very familiar. And for the Panthers to really weather that storm... That goal by Sam Reinhart, that laser of a snipe of a shot, another oh, play where clapper. there was a nice screen in front. Yeah. That changed the momentum in a way that the Panthers have not been able to do traditionally over the years in big moments. And now we've seen, we saw it a lot last year in the playoffs, and we're seeing them pick up right where they left off last year. Man, it's, it's unprecedented. And to think that the Panthers could sweep Tampa Bay in their own building, how poetic how just cathartic would that be for a fan base that has been suffering as long as the Panthers have? And to watch their neighbors to the north win three Stanley Cups. Mm. So, yeah, big big game on Saturday coming up. Three, on, three unanswered goals by the Panthers in that little stretch there. Um, and the Panthers shut down that vaunted lightning power play. Yes. All four of those power plays done. And Kevin Stenland, by himself on one power play, with his <laughs> own stick, ended up knocking the puck out of his own, one of which led to a shorthanded chance. So Kevin Stanley on the, on the penalty kill has been excellent. Is that maybe the signing of the offseason for the Panthers? We didn't really talk a lot about it at the time. You know, they, they brought in OEL, they got Mikola. Kevin Stenland, they brought him in specifically to fix the PK. Mm-hmm. This Florida's penalty kill was not, you know, was average maybe, but struggled during the playoffs. It was certainly an area. And you remember that Boston series, it felt like every time that Boston was coming back, they got a power play goal. Uh, Stenland has really fortified that unit and turned it into one of the best in the league. They finished, I think, sixth in the NHL, but they're flexing their muscles this season. They gave up the one goal to Stamkos in game one in the final minute. We, you almost don't even want to count that as well. You don't want to give them that as a power play goal. Stamkos scored the one power play goal in game two, and that's it. So I think mm-hmm. they're, what, two for 12 now? Yeah. That's really good. If for Against number, that team. For the number one power play in the league? Florida's winning the special teams battle in this series, and that's why they're up 3 to nothing. So we are in our situation right now. The Panthers became the first Stanley Cup finalists from the previous season to start the next postseason with three straight wins since the 84 Oilers. Wow. And the 9-4. That 84 Oilers team, I'm pretty sure that the, it ended pretty well for them, too. Yeah. And the 9-4 and four on the road over the past two Stanley Cup uh, playoffs. So good for them. They've done Yep. Excellent so far. They were one of the best road teams in the league during the regular season, so it's not surprising to see that continue to see that continue in the playoffs. And also, dating back to last year, the Panthers Roy have dominated, dominated the Eastern Conference in mm-hmm. the playoffs. Because last year where they go twelve and four mm-hmm. in the three rounds. Yeah. So now they're three and oh, so fifteen and four over the last two seasons against the Eastern Conference. That's Pretty, pretty good. All right, we got Dennis Bernstein from the fourth period and Sirius XM NHL Love Radio. Dennis. Yeah, we're going to talk about the entire NHL playoffs. That's coming up next. All right, joining us right now is Dennis Bernstein from the fourth period. You can catch him on Sirius XM NHL Radio. We're going to get started right now on the entire playoff landscape. Let's start with uh, the Bruins and Maple Leafs. William Nylander. 
Now, we don't know what's going on with him. There's a lot of rumors and everything right now. Mm -hmm. uh, he might be hurt. He might be in the doghouse. I really don't know. What do you know, Dennis? I think it's an injury, and I think it's a head injury. And if I say it's a head injury, Belly, then you can figure out what the type of head injury it is. Mm. I think it's a legitimate injury of keeping him off the ice, and, and that's why – he can go out and skate on the ice and, you know, goes out. And if he has, you know, they check the recovery after he gets off the ice for a couple of hours and he can't go. So I think that that's a situation with the thing. I don't think it's anything nefarious. I don't think he did anything wrong or he's being punished or anything like that. I think it's a legitimate injury. And, and that's and if that's the type of injury it is, you know, belly and Dwarky, then you don't know. You don't know how long he's going to be back. They certainly need him yeah. because every time you think this team climbs over the hill against the Bruins – they fall like the other night. Like, and what's what's it? They haven't scored more than three goals in 10 playoff games or something like that. So when you're suffering offensively and 100 point players out of the lineup, the result is they're down 2 1 and they're having issues scoring. The other rumor is that he got hurt during the game versus the Panthers. If the team knew that he got hurt versus the Panthers, why did he play game 82? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. That's probably only Paul Maurice and Bill Zito and the training staff can play. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't diagnosed, but you know, Billy, sometimes what happens, you get hit in the head and it, you know, the, the, uh, the effects of it don't come out for a couple of days or something like that. Like I'm all for resting. You know, uh, look guys, there's no such thing as load management in the NHL <laughs> and there should be, there should be, because you know why players want to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sit out. If they're healthy, they don't want to play. So, yeah, you can question. There's some questionable reasons why guys down the stretch should have never played. Like Aiden Hill, I think, played late in, in the series, in, in the season when it didn't mean anything. So why do you do that? So I can't question him because I don't know the, the, the timing of it. But if it is, let's say it is a concussion, sometimes those things come don't come to light for a couple of days. And sometimes players try to play through without telling the uh, training staff or the team. Dennis, I want to talk to you about the series that I know you're covering very closely, and that's the uh, the Kings and the Oilers. Super fun so far. Obviously, Game 2 was awesome, particularly if you're a yeah. Kings fan. Adrian Kempe, some really pretty goals. Uh, but uh. your take on the series, because this is year three that we're getting Kings-Oilers. Is Los Angeles finally going to get over the hump this year? Does it look like mm -hmm. in Game 2 that they can absolutely do that? Well, Dorky, one of the most intriguing things was it's, it was warmer in Edmonton than Los Angeles when I was there. <laughs> no I just came back way. from one and two. I come, it was it was sixty five degrees, but you know Alberta being Alberta, it was thirty mile an hour winds, so it wasn't really sixty five. Yeah, Dorky, they got a puncher's chance, and here's why. I'll, I'll say this: big picture, the Oilers are not winning a Stanley Cup with, with Stuart Skinner. They're just not. <laughs> no. He's not good enough. I, he's. I think his save percentage against the Kings going right back to last season and this in the playoffs. It's like 870. He's just not good. It's just not good enough. Like the fourth goal that um, that Fiala scored against the boards, I mean, he just threw the puck at that. It went in. I know it's a little bit of a screen. I'm just not convinced that the way the Kings can win, their path to victory is through the goal, through Stuart Skinner. Because like, I don't know, guys, but they can't figure out how to stop that power play. And they're, I think, 50% going back to last playoff. And look, it, they don't do that against any other team, but this team, they just crush it. So it's going to be a long, contentious series, Dorky, just like the other ones. I, I picked the Oilers in six. Would it shock me if the Kings won? No, because when I watched Skinner play in net, you right. can't be confident. And what they did in game two was they would they showed the Oilers too much respect in game one. Like they backed off. They never set up that 1-3-1. One, one. They were more aggressive on their on their forecheck. And you saw even on the first goal, Evan Bouchard turns off the turns over the puck. It's in the back of the net. And Kepe is an oil killer. He does great against them. The first goal is a really nice shot. That second one was beautiful. Oh, what but, a nice deflection. Yeah. But we've been here before, Dorky. Like, we're here, like, every time game three in L.A., the last two series was 1-1. So, although the Oilers have great offense and, they're, and Connor's amazing in the first game, you know, and Zach Hyman's having a wonderful year, there's not much to separate teams. There's just their styles are so different. Yeah. That's why when you look at an offensive team, you think, okay, I mean, after, especially after game one, they're going to walk through. But the Kings check for their chances and, and get, get some saves from Cam Talbot like he did on um, Leon Dreisaitl in the late second period. They got a puncher's chance to win the series, but rightfully so, the Edmonton Oilers should still be favors. And the Stars go to Knights series right now. The go to Knights are up 2 nothing. They are majority mm, yeah. uh, healthy right now. I mean, they basically got yeah. everybody back. I, you mentioned Aiden Hill. He might be a little bit nicked up, but that's about yeah. it. But are the Dallas Stars in full-fledged trouble right now? Yeah, because, look, Belly, I picked them to go to the cup final. Love the team. Jim Nill's done an amazing job building that roster. An amazing job. Like, Wyatt Johnson, 33 goals. He's their third-line center. It's the only team in the league that's like that. I love him. 
Except for one thing. I was, a wor- I was worried about one thing. Jake Ottinger. Again, goaltending. Mm-hmm. Like, Jake wasn't... Jake was sub-900 in the playoffs, sub-900 this season, and now that, those four goals in game one, I'm sorry, he's just not good enough. And that's the issue. That's the problem. And you're right. I, I, my point, when people ask me about Vegas, I'm like, well, which team is going on the ice? What actual players are going to hit the ice for game one? And... It was funny. I was in the press box at Edmonton, and I'm like walking around pregame, and it's the late starting game. And I go up to Pickle. You never guess who would have scored the first goal for Dallas, uh, for for Vegas in Dallas. One minute, one minute, twenty three seconds into the game, some guys knew, other guys didn't. And I said, Mark Stone, and everybody starts <laughs> laughing as soon as I say that. I go, Of course he did. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Billy, how this team has gone from like darlings when they first came in. Now that without question, they're the most hated team. Dallas is in big trouble. They really are. They can't beat this team. They didn't beat them last year in the conference final. I liked them. I picked them. They were a healthier team. But Vegas, you know what? That's the one team that didn't care where they finished, guys. Like eight, seven, win the division. Who cares? Get us in the tournament. And let's go. So they, they look a lot. I'll tell you, on paper, when you look at the lineup, it, it's better than the one that won a championship because they have Hurdle. They have Hannafin. It, it's it's a very dangerous team, and yes, Dallas is in big trouble. This has to be their game seven, the, the game three. They have to win that game, or or, or the Vegas Golden Knights are going on. So every game has to be game seven for them. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the next one does. Like if they go down three zip, it's it's over two one, maybe a shot, but yeah, it's a little bit of edge. But mentally, right? You know, you were the favorite. You're going in. You had home ice. You blew those two games. This has to this has to be a desperate Dallas Stars team. And I'm not sure that like they're desperate. That that's the whole thing because they, their mentality was we had, we were the number one seed and and we should not walk through Vegas. Nobody was going to walk through Vegas, but they didn't do enough. So yeah, there's just not enough desperation in Dallas right now to win those games. And now they're going to go to Vegas, and that crowd's going to be nuts. It's going to be a major test for them to get back in the series now, despite how good they are. I really think they are. Yeah, I think Dallas's main shot is the only really question mark Vegas has is their goaltending. Like Aiden Hill yeah. was unbelievable last year. He went on that ridiculous run, but really that was out of nowhere. Logan Thompson is a bit unproven as well. So I think that might be the Kings only, or excuse me, the Stars' uh, main solace mm-hmm. there, Dennis. But I want to switch yeah. gears and talk about the Eastern Conference now. I want to talk sure. a little bit about the Panthers and the Lightning. Uh, for a 3-0 series, Dennis, it's been a great, great three games. Yeah. Tight hockey, amazing goaltending. What have your thoughts been on it so far? I, Dorky, I want to know who's recording all the hits in the NHL this year, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like in the playoffs. Like those numbers are like really like what, game one for the Kings. It was sixty five hits. I'm like, I don't think they hit them well sixty five times. Look, here's the thing. I I thought and it still could be. I thought that this series was a blood series. Like it was going to go seven. Yeah. It was going and the team that came out of it was going to be really all banged up. And you know the next the next round would have been really a tough struggle. And you're right, the games have been close. They've been contentious. They've been entertaining. They've been dramatic. But the Panthers are going to win game four. They're going to have three games where they wouldn't have the big go on against their, you know, in, interstate cousins. So that's a huge advantage for them. Because when you think about series matchups, you think, wow, that's going to be really tough. You know, you guys know the teams really hate each other. So for them to get out of 3 nothing lead, I'm not sure. I know one guy that's not going to quit, John Cooper. He is fantastic. The way his, his attitude, his bench interviews. Um, and the question is, how many guys on Tampa are going to show up for four? Because they're not wearing in the series now. Like, how are they going to go out? They're going to go out meekly. You know, you know, Stammer's got a contract to worry about, so it's going to be really, yeah. really interesting. But if the Panthers met, let's say they even give you know, Lightning game four. If they can get out in five and not have to play more stressful games, it really is going to help them in the second round and possibly beyond. The two playoff series coming out of the Metro seem to be over, right, DB? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're done. They were done before they started, though. Yeah. Like I, 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 I thought. Look, I, Caps. I maybe gave them one game, Roy, because maybe Charlie Lund stands up and has a great game in DC, or Ovi gets a hat trick or something like that. But they were overmatched. And the Islanders, I, I picked the Carolina to win the cup. And what's going on with the goaltending with Patrick Wall? You got an eight million dollar goaltender. And I know he hasn't been great, right? I know Varlamov's been better, but now there's going to be certainly, you know, some maybe some concern about who's really the guy there. So yeah, the Islanders are going to win maybe one, two games. They're a pesky team. They were playing great down the stretch, but let's be real: the Rangers and the Carolina Hurricanes were the class of the Metro. So I'm not shocked that we're that they're short series because they were the far better teams, uh, pound for pound. As far as the as far as the Rangers Capital series, is it? Is this it for Ovi? Is Alexander Ovechkin? Does he have enough gas in the tank to at least go one more season and try to break Wayne Gretzky's goal yeah. record? Billy, he he signed that that contract. I think it's a three year extension. He signed it to break the record. 
Mm-hmm. The owner, Ted Leonsis, loves him. He's not going anywhere. He'll he'll keep playing. And the good thing about it is because when you watch that, look at that team on paper, Belly, start the season, it's like, how long is it going to take for Alex to get that record? Because the team isn't any good around him. Backstrom got hurt, basically retired. You know, you have guys like McMichael and Strunk, and they really facilitate goals. And then he got really hot at the end of the season. So, Belly, he will play until he breaks the record. I don't think it'll be next season, probably early Probably like maybe Christmas of you know twenty twenty six or something like that. But <laughs> Bell, he's play, he's playing until he breaks the record, and, and I think the way he finished the season tells you it's probably going to be sooner than a little bit later. Mm. So Dennis, out west, is Vancouver done? That's your Demko's hurt. We don't know exactly what's happening with him. I thought Nashville yeah. was going to give them a hard time heading into the series yeah. when they were healthy. But now I'm thinking uh, Nashville. They've almost got kind of a path laid out for them to round two. Is is they Vancouver do. seriously in trouble here? They are. And, you know, now there's a huge advantage in net for Nashville, right? And I watched Vancouver down the stretch, and they were like a 500 team, primarily because Casey DeSmith was in net, not Thatcher Demko. And I picked Vancouver to win the series because of Thatcher Demko. And now he's out. He won't play till till round two if they get there. Yeah, they're in a lot of trouble. And that's a big physical team that Nashville has. They're not the most talented, but you know something? You guys know this. When's Bruno going to get some credit for being a great coach? He did it in Florida. He did it with this team. They play very, very well. They're tight. And look at that lineup, Gorky. They had Colton Sissons as a second line center. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and tra- you know, it's when you look at a Luke Evangelista, the guys that like you don't even know, you know, who's number 40? Who's Stastny? Now, is it Peter Stastny's son? Like it's it, it's a great coaching job. And yeah, I I expect, and here's the wild thing. Here's why we love the playoffs. The two wild cards are moving on in the West. Yes. That that's that's that, that's how great this sport is. That's how much parity there is. So when you talk about seeding and all this other thing and wild card and you know getting to the third and the division, you know it it doesn't matter. It's so great. Uh, last matchup here: the uh, Jets and Avalanche. That seems to be going seven. Do you think? Yeah, I, I'm still waiting for a save in that series. From someone, <laughs> yes, but... right. What happened to Colorado? <laughs> and and that's the thing about yeah. If you if you Colorado after the first thing you're saying, we just beat Hellbuck six times and didn't win the game. Right, and this was supposed to be the matchup, guys, of the best goaltender in the playoffs against the worst, and now it's kind of like the two bad goaltenders. I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, this looks like seven because Colorado's got so much offense, and now you can't really rely on Hellbuck to win you a game. You figure maybe one, two games. He still, and I like them coming in because they were a hotter team, and and Colorado was so bad defensively. They were really, really bad defensively down the stretch. But yeah, Roy, this is going seven. It's gonna be really. It's gonna be really entertaining to see a game seven in Winnipeg. That crowd's gonna be off the chain. All right, that's the playoffs, folks. We just covered it. That is great <laughs> from Sirius XM NHL Radio and the Four Period. Dennis Bernstein, we appreciate you joining us. Oh, so always a pleasure, boys. And I'll uh, maybe I'll see you at the Cup final. Maybe. I think you will. <laughs> Love you, DB. See you guys. Thank you uh, very thanks, much. Dennis. That was great. Oh, anytime, man. Anytime, man. Anytime you want me to just ask. Awesome, oh, yeah. Man. You'll be back by the time this thing's okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Be good, DB. Yeah. Take care. Okay, guys. Take care, boys. See you. We all have that friend who wakes up early to go get everyone McDonald's breakfast while the rest of us sleep in. This is your sign to thank them. And if you're that friend, this is us saying thank you. Just a friendly reminder that right now, get any size iced coffee before 11 a.m. for just 99 cents. And a satisfying sausage McMuffin with egg is just $2.79. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal.